What's poppin' everybody? Welcome back to the channel. It's KB and we locked in, now let's jump into it. Today, we're gonna be talking about Vibes Cartel, the most famous, dangerous Jamaican dancehall artist ever blessed the mic. We're gonna cover who he is, how he became so big, and the circumstances that led him to being sentenced to a minimum of 35 years in prison. Now, I've told a ton of stories on this channel, but this is by far one of the wildest ones. So without further ado, let's go. Hey, real quick before we get started, a quick disclaimer. This video has a lot of clips from Jamaican artists speaking in Jamaican Patois, which is like French and kind of broken English. So shout out to my boy Nashon, aka Pharaoh, aka Tipsy, who took time out of his day, two days in a row, and spent all day with me transcribing these clips to try to make them understandable for the people that don't speak Jamaican Patois. Again, shout out to him. And this is just a quick disclaimer that we did add captions. They may not be a one for wooden word translation as you guys are watching the video you may notice that it sounds like he said something different in the caption said that's because we tried to take what was being said and translate them one to one into english so that everybody could enjoy this video and i just wanted to take a moment to shout him out with that being said and that disclaimer out the way let's go ahead and get into the video Welcome back to Primetime News. A shocking revelation by investigators in the Vibes Cartel murder case today as a dancehall artist and three other members of the Portmore Empire appeared in court. The men are accused of murder and their attorneys demanding bail. Today, investigators disclose some of the evidence they're pursuing against all four. A glimpse of Cartel on his way to court today. He has been in and out of court since the police nabbed him for one murder, locked him away and charged him with a second. And on each visit, the word from his attorneys has been consistent, bail denied. It means essentially that because the witnesses were coming, they wanted to read the statement into evidence without the witness actually being there. Um, as it relates to one particular witness, from the very early stages he had indicated that um, we had some concerns about the identity of this witness. Not that the witness didn't exist per se, because I'm sure that there was a real person who had given that statement. Mm -hmm. But as to that person's identity, here's right. what we were trying to ascertain. Um, to no avail. All of our checks throughout the trial proved that the witness had no birth certificate, the witness had no TRN, the witness was not on the voter's ID voters list anywhere um, the three schools that he indicated he attended there is no record of that witness there's no record of that person born on that day to those particular parents there is no record of this person all right now i believe that vibes cartel get to unfair trial vibes cartel vibes cartel vibes cartel vibes cartel, vibes cartel. Vibes cartel. some of y'all may be familiar with the name some may not but vibes is undoubtedly one of the best artists to ever do it and his influence in the music industry is massive even in 2024 despite him having been incarcerated since 2011. vibes cartel is one of my biggest inspirations that's a very in intriguing artist to work with at the end of the day i just know what my experience is with him and i know what he does for me in music he's an insp inspiring motherfucker and he work hard too He's one of the few artists that, no matter what it seems, to never lose relevancy. And it seems like every other week, we're seeing reports claiming that Vibes has been released from prison. These reports are mostly false though, and he hasn't been released, at least not yet, but it doesn't stop these stories from popping up. His incarceration has also not stopped him from making and releasing new music either, with new songs hitting the internet from Vibes regularly at this point. So today, we're gonna be taking a dive into the story of Vibes Cartel, learning about how he became such a massive figure, the twisted story of the murders that led to his prison sentence, and what the future looks like moving forward. 18 degrees north of the equator lies Jamaica, a tropical paradise for some, a living nightmare for others. Jamaica is the fourth largest island country in the Caribbean, located just west of Haiti, south of Cuba, and east of the Cayman Islands. 
is divided into 14 parishes, with Kingston, the capital of Jamaica, acting as a parish itself. All 14 of these parishes are then split into basically three bigger parishes, Cornwall, Middlesex, and Surrey. Basically, like 14 counties spread across three states for the Americans in the building who I just confused. Now, Jamaica has the seventh largest harbor in the world with the Kingston Harbor, and the entire country is about 146 miles long and about 52 miles wide, meaning you could fit roughly 62 Jamaicas inside of the state of Texas. It's made up of valleys and plains in the west and center, often called cockpit country by the locals, with the small mocha and dry harbor mountains in the center and the blue mountains with Jamaica's tallest point, Blue Mountain Peak, starting around Kingston in the east. The largest cities aside from Kingston would be Spanish Town and Portmore. While most people are familiar with the bigger island of Jamaica, the truth is though, there are about 30 other islands, islets, keys, and sandbanks lining the shores, with the biggest one being Great Goat Island, located in the south around Moore's Pen. Also, if you ever go, you'll notice something crazy about Jamaica, and that is how the locals name the places in it. Places like Broke Neck Gully, Rat Trap, Betty's Hope, Rest and Be Thankful, See Me No More, Time and Patience, Wait a Bit, and Me No Send, You No Come. <laughs> Bro, these names are great. Anyways, there are also places in Jamaica called Maroon Villages, which are villages made up of descendants from slave ancestors that escaped captivity and created their own little free societies in the mountain. And still till this day, these villages operate kind of autonomously from the rest of Jamaica. Slaves were initially brought to Jamaica to harvest sugar plants, if y'all didn't know. And most of the slaves that were brought there came from Africa and India, which brings me into the next part of this story, which is the chronic or the ganja. Now, I'm sure that most of y'all know that cannabis is seen as a giant part of Jamaican culture, but I found it interesting to learn that it was actually introduced to Jamaican culture by indentured servants from India that were brought over to the island to work in the 1800s. And while the island is known for its use of cannabis heavily, you might be surprised to find out that until 2015, it was actually illegal to even have it. It wasn't until 2015 that it was decriminalized and now people can have up to two zips, five plants, and Rastafarians are allowed to consume it for religious purposes. Another thing that I wanna hit on is the Rastafarians. As an American, I can say that when people think of a Jamaica from America, we normally imagine somebody dressed like and practicing the philosophies of Rastafarianism, mostly because of Bob Marley's influence, but in reality, only about 5% of the population is Rastafarian. The rest of the people are spread across different religious groups, with Christianity being the most popular in the country. Also, Jamaica has more churches per square kilometer than anywhere else on earth, but that's not all Jamaica is known for. Most people know it for its music. Starting in the 1950s, Sky and Rocksteady were the precursors to the 60s and 70s, reggae and dance hall melodies, which some say paved the way for future genres like hip hop and EDM. Now, that was very much an oversimplification of Jamaica and its history, but it was here that the topic of today's video, Vibes Cartel, is from and the culture that he was raised in, the roots of the story, if you will. There's more to Jamaica than that, like the country's problem with corruption, its confusing government structure, and all that, but if you want to know more, I highly suggest you check out this video I made about Bob Marley, as I cover a ton of the political history of Jamaica in that video, and I don't really want to run it back here, because it would just be repeating the same thing. With that said, y'all go watch that video if you want to know more. If not, let's go ahead and get into the main topic of today's video, Vibes Cartel. Vibes Cartel, real name Adijo Palmer, was born January 7th, 1976 in the capital city of Kingston, but grew up in Portmore in the Waterford community, which is about 19 minutes away from Kingston on the outskirts of the city. He had a total of five siblings growing up. Family structure, both parents, you know what I mean? One brother, four sisters, normal family life. Same? Yeah, man. So you, you, you were brought up in, in, in a fairly stable home? Yeah, man, definitely, man, both parents, man. Like many households in the Caribbean, his parents put a heavy emphasis on educational excellence, something that we've heard before from academics who is also from Jamaica. School is viewed so differently in other countries. So I, uh, you know, me and my brother growing up in Jamaica, you got grades, but you also got ranked. 
Mm. So it was known. So for example, if it's a class of 30 people, they used to clown the person who was the dumbest, who was the 30th of 30. Because they write it on your report card. You're the 30, you're the worst, you're the slowest in the class. Right. Real talk. So, so they, they, they compare you against each other. By the way, that's something that doesn't exist in, in, in um, American high schools until you get to college, where they start grading on a curve. Uh -huh. Right, yeah. I remember like even uh, um, going to high school and my mom was just always honest about grades, grades, grades. And it was just basically kind of like an overtone, like, yo, we're sending you to college to become like something esteemed. We want doctors and lawyers. And for any immigrants that's listened to this, you'll know that feeling. You, yeah. The family wants doctors, lawyers, dentists. So it became, yo, you gotta be something. So, so how did they feel about your rebelliousness at, 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 at teenage? At, well, at well, teenage? well, my father and I were always at odds, you know, because my father wanted me to. My father's the type of man that don't want to give a show for unsure. So he was always adamant that we get an education, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Try to get at least a trade, you know what oh, I mean? If okay. we weren't making it in the education, no matter. But even with this overtone from his parents, Vibes just couldn't get himself focused enough to compete academically growing up. Not that he wasn't smart because he was very much an intelligent person. Even back then, he just was putting his effort into other things. In fact, while attending Calabar High School in Kingston, his truancy became so bad and so frequent that they just decided it was best to expel him altogether at some point. And while his father really wanted him to focus on his education and making something of himself through a traditional trade, Vibe says that his mom knew that he wanted to do music and she was as supportive as a mother could be, pretty much knowing that he was gifted and thought that he should be allowed to explore that as heavily as he wanted to. Plus, he had two uncles who were upcoming DJs in Jamaica that kind of helped influence him. So his mother's big brothers were also in music, so she understood the passion. Tell you were born where? I was born in Kingston, Jubilee. Mm -hmm. Grew up in Portmore, Waterford. Yeah, went to school? Went to school, Waterford, Infant, Waterford Primary, Calabar High School. Got expelled. Not for, for Not for educational reasons, for the truancy. Skull school style. Always been hanging around at students all over S Kingston. Start. But from a tender age, Vibes Cartel knew that my calling was music. And it was like my mother saw that. Because she, she always um, encouraged me to do anything where music was concerned. Like even when I would sneak out to go, it, go out late and at the age of 13 and 14 to stage shows and my father would do, didn't want to let me in. My mother would curse him and say, let in the boy, wait, wait, wait. Mm -hmm. And he said, yeah, so my mother was always supportive of me being a, a musician because she had brothers who were my uncles who were also aspiring DJs. They really never made it in the business, but they were also one of my early influences. Despite being expelled though, Vibes ended up continuing his education at the Tutorial College, a private school in Kingston, where he graduated with English, History, Geography, and Literature at CXC levels. CXC levels basically being the equivalent of a high school diploma in America. Get bad early. Yeah, you know what I mean? But we finished our education at Tutorial College, which was a private high school because my father was adamant that I had to graduate. And even though he didn't excel when he was in school, this dedication to hard work is something that Vibes has tried to pass down to his kids too, trying his best to make sure that they take their education as serious as they can. If you hear your youngest, you know, singing the content or a ramping shop, you wouldn't be offended at all? I never heard him singing it, you know, but the greatest thing about it, I never heard a teacher at school saying he sang it either. You know what I mean? When I get reports from the school for, about my children, always good reports. You know what I mean? So it's all about how you grow your child. You know what I mean? Because the world is around us and what we do is an expression of the world. My kids have to grow in how my parents grew me. I was, I was brought up a, a disciplined child. I never knew how I got so wild. Yeah. But seriously though. My, <laughs> I, I was brought up um, in a decent, a fairly decent, a pretty decent. Um, parenting method and that is the same parenting method I apply to my children. The young Adesia was exposed to a wide variety of music from a young age by his two uncles who were aspiring musicians themselves. Every weekend he would be treated to new musical offerings on his uncle's old component set ranging from Sam Cooke and country and western ballads to Ninja Man who eventually became one of his musical foes later in this story. At around the age of 10 his favorite artists included Papa Sign, Charlie Chaplin, 
Will Smith, and KRS-One, all of whose lyrics he said he would write down and memorize so he could perform them later for the entertainment of his friends and family. Yeah, growing up, which artists know, which artists you see? Ninja right? Man, see me. Ninja. Shabba, Papa San Luton and Stitchy. I know there was lyricists at the time, Professor Nuts, Boris Gardner, GSC Lodge, Fresh Prince, I mean, listen, everybody growing up, KRS-One. Now Vibes decided to hone in on his skills and concentrate on winning over his own community of Waterford until he was ready for bigger things. With that goal in mind, on weekends, he would practice his art on the neighborhood sound systems that were in various shops around the area. In 1993, Vibes, who was now in his mid-teens, recorded his first single titled Love Fat Women for Alvin Reed's One Heart label under the name Addie Benton. He used the first few initials of his first name for the Addie and adopted Benton from one of his musical inspirations at the time, Boozhu Benton, who was another fellow dance hall artist. Vibes Carter started out just as any other um, dance hall DJ, you know, started out as an avid fan, loving the music. You know what I mean? I can remember when I asked my father one time when I was a small child, if I, you know, the real of the people in the way I sing, you know? Yeah, so we, we we born in music, like some uncles used to DJ, you know what I mean? They never really made it, you know what I mean? But I, I used to emulate them and wanted to be like them so much, you know what I mean? So we started growing up, you know, I started going out now to um, like talent shows in the area, you know what I mean? Gang show and get a couple of boo, you know what I mean? Learn the art, yeah. go back to the drawing board and just yeah, I'm gradually bill and bill and bill until we became like semi-professional, you know, like in Portmore. He would frequent the weekly gong talent show at the Coney Amusement Park on the outskirts of Kingston and help build buzz, although it wasn't very successful. Undeterred by his weekly failure to impress the talent show audience, he continued to pursue his passion and he recorded several more tracks for local producers, perfecting his craft over the next few years. In 1996, he and his two friends, Mr. Lee and another singer named Escobar, decided to form a group. At this time, groups were pretty popular across all genres of music. It was 1996. I mean, at the time, there was the Spice Girls, the Fugees, Bone Thugs and Harmony, the Backstreet Boys, and a bunch more. It was basically a trend. Everybody in 1996 was in some sort of group, so it only made sense for them to try to make this move. One night, after watching a movie about Pablo Escobar and his infamous cartel, Adesia came up with the name for his trio, Vibes Cartel. Now, this group would not become famous as a trio, but it was the beginning of something great for Adesia. The three recorded some songs and started doing local shows, but to no avail though. It seemed like it just wasn't moving for them until, by chance, they would catch the attention of a man named Rohan Butler. Rohan was a local show promoter slash artist manager who made quite a name for herself around the Waterford area. After seeing Adesia performing as a DJ at a local party via a dedicated cable TV station that only played recaps of dance hall parties from the area, Rohan decided he needed to reach out and see if he could provide assistance for the group. After setting up a meeting with the group, them and Rohan agreed to work together, but it wouldn't go as smoothly as everybody thought it would because, and this was according to Rohan himself, the other two members of Vibes Cartel just weren't as ambitious or talented enough. Despite that though, Rohan continued to believe in Adija's ability, especially with his penmanship, so he offered to just manage him. This led to the group basically being dissolved and Adija being the only member left, but instead of changing his name or going back to ID Benton, he just decided to stick with Vibes Cartel by himself. So what was it about Cartel that, that drew you to him? Or was it he who found you? No, well, interestingly, you know, <laughs> back in the days in the 90s, early 90s, we used to have the, the cable company just got introduced mm -hmm. to um, Portmore. So we had a channel called Channel 33. Yes. On, on the cable company where all the show is videos of parties that happened previously, you know? So I was watching it one day while I was a woman. There was a stage show in, in, in Gregory Park and Cartel was performing. But the context of his lyrics, when I heard it, I was like, this, this, this is no normal person. I've never heard a DJ spitting lyrics like this before in all my years. And I was a Beanie Man fan. I was a Bounty Killer fan. <laughs> I was a Papa San fan. And Papa San to me was 
the greatest lyricist of the, at, the, at that time. Mm -hmm. So some things that Cartel was saying, I was like, this is not normal, but I never know him. Didn't know where he lived, didn't know nothing about him. Although I was living in Waterford and he was in Waterford. Mm -hmm. Never met him before. Okay. There's this guy that used to record um, the parties, video, the parties, um, White Lock. Mm -hmm. So I said, listen to me, man, this guy, I need to know him. So White Lock said, yeah, man, I know him, man. I said, all right, let him know that I need to talk to him. So it was like a couple of days after White Lock came to me, I said, you know, I got in touch, touch with him, man. He's going to come see you. So I had a party coming up in Waterford and when Cartel came to see me, he came, it was, it was three of them. A lot of people don't know that Vibes Cartel was a crew. Mm -hmm. The crew was called Vibes Cartel. So he was Adi Bantan. Then you had Mr. Lee and then you had Escobar as a singer. So it was two DJs and one singer. And that of course explains the, the name, the, the word cartel in his name. Right, exactly. Cartel, Car cartel is a cartel group. was a group. Right, exactly. Yes. It was a group. So they came and I said, listen, I'm having a party. We invited car uh, the crew and they came. They performed. Like two, three days after the party, they came back and saw me and I said, do you have a manager? They said, no, not really, you know. I said, would you like me to be a manager? So he gave me that opportunity, being that he was the leader of the group to say, yes, be the manager. I got them on Champion in Action. This was before Louise Bennett died. And Louise said, they're gonna perform at five o'clock. But in my head, I was like, five o'clock? That's too early. Nobody's not gonna see them. So in a way, I said, listen, I'm gonna meet my house at three. Three o'clock on the dot, Adi Bantan, who is now Vice Cartel, was at my gate. Mm -hmm. Four o'clock, Mr. Lee turned up. Five o'clock, no Escobar. <laughs> so we decided that, okay, we're gonna drive to his house. So the three of us got in the car, we drive to his house. When we went there, he was sitting on the veranda with two girls braiding his ear at five o'clock. And I'm like, oh, me tell you, say you're going to work at five. At five, you're still doing your hair? So I said, okay. So now I start thinking like, me can't deal with them idiot here, you know? Among other idiots before. So that's when I decided that this is it for me. I'm going to leave these guys alone, you know, because they're not serious. So when I got to the show, I said, you know what? Cartel have a real talent. So I said to him, I'm going to put you up there first. Let you perform. So you're going to perform two songs by yourself and then you call them up to do the, the song that you're known with them for. So it went that way. He performed, went well. When they came off stage, um, Jack Scarpio mm -hmm. and King Jam just standing side by side. But because I met them during my runnings, they called me over and they said, you see the tall black one and bad. I said, I know him and that's what I do what I did. Because I wanted to showcase and let people know where the talent really is. After the show, I told them, I said, listen now. You're fired. I'm done. <laughs> no, I told them, I said, I'm done. You fired them or you said... You, no, everybody, group, everybody, whole everybody, whole group. I said, I'm okay. done. Now, Ron answers the question. How did he become Adi Banton's manager after firing his cartel? About two days after that cartel come back to my house and he said, listen now. I can't carry them from my back go off a tree from Portmore, you know. So I still want you to be my manager, you know. Because now, Cartel see me getting from champion in action. And him know, say, this never happened for him before. Mm. With that, it became official. Rohan was now managing Vibes as a solo act. He got to work instantly, and his angle of attack when it came to breaking Vibes was simple. He would hit up any show promoters that were throwing what he considered to be a good show and would negotiate any way possible for Vibes to get his chance on stage at these events. This often led to Vibes performing with no fee, meaning that neither him nor Rohan would get paid, but this is a strategy that was working, and it allowed Vibes to get noticed by the bigger acts 
that he would be in the building with. One of these people was another artist named Bounty Killer, who at the time was massive. Now Rohan tried to get vibes on stage with Bounty, but Bounty and Vibes hadn't met yet, and Rohan's cosign just wasn't enough for Bounty to pull Vibes up on stage with him just yet. Instead, Vibes was slated to perform a few hours before Bounty. After the show, though, Bounty watched the tape back and seen Vibes' performance and apparently was impressed with what he saw. And this would eventually open up a ton of doors for Vibes' career. I had met Bone Tequila from 1998 when I was having a party and he did the commercial for me yes. to promote the party. And then that is why, oh, when I gave him the big screen for Saga to the East in 1999. I'm ready for that. Yes, and I said to him, I have an artist, you know, that I want to perform, but I want him to perform when you are performing. And he was like, you can't guarantee me that. Because then he never meet cartel yet, they don't know nothing about cartel. But me, I convinced him, said, no man, the youth are bad. It's so happened that the cartel was slotted to work much earlier than Killer. So after Saga to the East, I guess Killer watched the tape. Because when I went to the car wash to see Killer, I said, now I know why you tell me to call up this dude when I was working. Him bad man. This new connection between Rohan, Vibes, and Bounty Killer would eventually turn into something much bigger when Rohan suggested that Vibes allow Bounty to be the face of one of his tracks. Rohan says that when he heard the song that Vibes had written, he just knew that Bounty Killer should be the one to do the song, but Vibes wasn't feeling it at first. However, since Rohan had been opening new doors for him, Vibes allowed Rohan to pitch the song to Bounty, and Bounty decided that he would in fact record the record, and this was really where Vibes started to get a breakthrough in the industry a little, even though it was for a record that nobody knew he wrote. Give Cartel ideas like topics and songs that he should write. Sometimes he does it, sometimes he doesn't. Sometimes he will call me in the morning and say, listen to this song. And if I say I don't like it, I remember one time he wrote a song and I said I didn't like it. And he said, what do you mean why you don't like it? And I said, I just, I just don't like it. Go, go work on it some more, man. A couple of days after when I asked him about the song, he said, dash it to him. I said, what do you mean why you dash it to him? He said, you say you don't like it, so I just dash it to him. So he called me in the morning and he, sing, he was singing the song. If I had a band and they'd rule the world. But the song was so well structured. It just like, gave me a Bounty killer vibes. So I said to him, say, you know I think Bounty should do this song. He said, so what do you mean by that? I said, yeah, man. But he didn't like the idea. I could tell. Okay. You know? But he didn't really come out and say it to me, say, no. I guess he trusted my, my vision or my knowledge and just say, all right. So oh, we ever get this to bunt him? I said, don't worry yourself. I took him to the studio, did a demo. So I got to the car wash and I would sit sometime bunt don't even turn up. And I had to leave, but one day eventually he turned up and I gave him the cassette. It was actually two songs on the cassette that I gave him. He took the cassette and said, okay, he's gonna listen to it. So one morning now, when I was on East Queen Street going back to Portmore, my phone rang. Answer the phone, and the man said, Butler, what are going? He said, Who this? He said, Bunty. He said, Yeah, it's Bunty. Come off on my phone, man, about Bunty. I hang up. <laughs> so the phone ring back again. I yeah. said, Yo, Who this? What you want? The man said, Butler, what are you? You can't believe it's Bunty killer, I call you. So that time I said, No, what Bunty for true? Because my phone never ring it, and it's Bunty killer. Mm -hmm. He's always face to face with talk. And he said, Yo, I will listen to the cassette. Boy, bad man. He said, when an artist is good, he's good, but are you telling him, wicked? So I start, I tell you, even though I talk now, I feel it. Mm -hmm. So Bounty, I said, yeah, man, I'm bad, man, we have to go do some work. He said, good. So after that, now, that's how Killer now and Cartel start doing songs. Cartel start writing songs. Killer hear more songs with Cartel. And I just saw the history start with the Cartel, Cartel and Killer the Cartel Bounty Killer thing. With the two now clicked up, Bounty Killer started to refer to this friendship and the relationships that he was building with other local artists as the Alliance. Basically, it was just like a group of people from the area that Bounty Killer was mentoring. According to Vibes, he would go on to write about 30 songs over the next few years for Bounty Killer. Songs like High Grade Forever, Warlord Rule the World, and Gal Clown, all of which were massive songs for Bounty. Now, after writing for Bounty for a few years and some of those songs he wrote becoming successful, it was time for Vibes to create 
create his own lane, and in 2003, he began to drop a string of hit records, culminating in the release of his debut album, Up To The Time, which featured the hit records that he had released throughout the year, and it was distributed by UK-based label Green Sleeves Records. He was also the number two selling member of the Alliance that year, only being beaten out by Elephant Man. Regardless, it was a phenomenal year for Cartel, when it solidified his presence in the game in a year that would change his life for forever. Also in 2003, he found himself at the center of his first real controversy after a pre-planned onstage class with another Jamaican artist, Ninja Man, at the annual dance hall festival Sting, which was held in Cartel's hometown of Portmore. The clash took a turn for the worst though. All right now, I gotta pause it there so we can stay in line with YouTube's terms of service, but basically Vibes hits this man with the hook that sends him flying backwards to the floor. And there's basically multiple angles of what happened online on YouTube. I'm sure you guys can find it if you wanna see it. But yeah, it got a little physical for a moment between the two and for the next six minutes, according to an article written about it in 2003, for the next six minutes, the rat-a-tat-tat -tat sound of audio automatic gunfire filled the air. So this was a crazy moment for sure, and one that brought a bunch of attention to Cartel, but his manager at the time, Rohan Butler, told authorities and reporters that it wasn't Cartel's fault, as it was a pre-planned clash on stage, it just wasn't supposed to get physical, and then when Ninja Man pushed Cartel, Cartel was simply swinging in self-defense, and after reviewing the footage, it does seem that Ninja Man pushed Cartel first. Despite this, Cartel decided it was best to take accountability for what happened, and said in a press conference that apologies are in order especially to the Don Gorgon Ninja Man and the organizers of Sting. I must accept responsibility. Well this is why I've started you know what I mean like the, the, the press release for certain promotions and I just like the fans out there to know that first of all I've got to apologize firstly and first of all to Ninja Man Desmond Valentine who has been with an icon in a dance hall for over like 15 years and the whole incident is such an unfortunate incident, but we just wish first to apologize to Ninja Man, then to the promoters of the event. Four days later, the two would make a public appearance together at the Flying Squad headquarters for the police in Kingston, where they told cameras that they had squashed their beef. Say, it's a misunderstanding, but to me, it's a foolish act. You understand? I mean, I know where it come from, but I see where it lead to. And it's my responsibility to tell Jamaica not to take this on the back of the field. My father, you have to just accept the losses, you know, because we're wrong, you see it. So when you're wrong, more you have to just become a mother, admit say you're wrong, you see what I say? So I just that you work with the other one. It never even reached your father with Ninja, man. You don't know the money a veteran with about 15, 20 years of the business where we are watched from, where are little youth. I can't have a peer going and sting much less, you see me? So you don't know, right now we just have met the people that know the first apology to the big man straight. The elder of the two, Ninja Man, said that both Cartel and Sting would suffer more fallout from the incident than he would. He suggested an olive branch that Sting promoters could consider. Sting, see it's a free show. See him place a jam world. Ninja Man vibes Cartel bound to kill her. Life and see it one time. Pats. Ninja, who had the option to press charges against Cartel for assault, declined to do so. Have them in the bullies. See how well got charged people for what? 38 year old Ninja Man was charged with assault, occasioning grievous bodily harm and disorderly conduct, while Cartel was charged with assault, occasioning bodily harm and disorderly conduct as well. But while Ninja Man was immediately released on a $15,000 station bill, the 27 year old Cartel and several members of his entourage were locked behind bars at the Central Police Station in downtown Kingston with no immediate release. They were reportedly being held in connection with two murders. Now the article didn't state what two murders they were being held for and Cartel was never charged with them but I assume it may have had something to do with the ammunition that they retrieved while arresting him. Deputy Commissioner Lucius Thomas said that Cartel was charged with breaches of the Town and Community Act and the Firearm Act along with disorderly conduct. He said quote unquote he was found with hollow point ammunition. The circumstances under which he got these type of cartridges are being investigated. And that's all that was really ever reported about these charges, so there's no telling what murders they were being investigated for. Now, while this marked the official come up point for Cartel, it was also the beginning of a ton of problems for him as well. While his music was doing phenomenal, it was drawing in a ton of attention, and some of it just wasn't so good. For starters, the year following the Ninja Man incident, 
Vibes found himself being nominated for the MOBO Award, which is the annual British Music Award presentation honoring achievements in music of black origin, or MOBO. However, Cartel's 2004 UK MOBO Award nomination was withdrawn amidst controversy over homophobic content in his lyrics. Elephant Man also had his nomination pulled after the judging panel for the awards received complaints from gay rights activists about discouraging remarks both had made in their earlier music. They demanded that both parties submit a written apology to the awards for their behavior, but neither sent one in, resulting in them pulling the nominations. A spokesperson for MOBO said, the last thing Mobo wants to do is encourage more prejudice. Mobo has not yet received written apologies as previously promised. We have therefore alerted the Mobo Academy to this situation and a decision has been taken to withdraw the nominations for Elephant Man and Vibes Cartel. Now, while unable to win this award, Cartel didn't slow down. He just went even harder, dropping two albums that year, Timeless and More Up To The Time both of which were immensely successful. Now the next part of this story has some conflict amongst fans as far as to when this actually took place, with some saying that it happened in 2003, some saying that it happened in 2004. Now I've tried my best to verify when this next part took place and from all the official news sources that I read, they said that this next part happened in 2005, so that's where I'm putting it in my timeline. So if you're Jamaican or a big fan and you think this happened in 03, don't be mad at me for putting it in 05, be mad at all the big news stations that said that this happened in 05, not me, bro. Go take it out on the news stations that reported 05. Now in 2005, Vibes will find himself in another beef with two more artists, one named Agent Sasko the Assassin and one named Spraga Benz. It started with Sasko though, as him and Vibes were being set up by Bounty Killer and Beanie Man for a pre-planned beef, something that the two thought would help lift both Vibes and Sasko's career up to new levels. It wasn't supposed to be a real beef though, but something more staged for the publicity. However, at the last minute, Sasko says that he wanted to back out of the deal and not do the beef, but it was too late. Sasko had already dropped a song titled We Are Bad From that wasn't directed to anybody in particular, but came off as a diss record to most who heard it. The thing is, Sasko swears that it wasn't a diss record and says that he decided not to indulge in the beef because he wanted to follow the example of one of his favorite artists, Boozu Benton, who he had never seen in a beef with any other artist throughout his career. Boozu always took the high road and never participated in the shenanigans. He says that he used that example when deciding if he wanted to beef with Cartel. According to Sasko, he was approached and told that the clash would happen between himself and Cartel without anybody losing any friendship and everybody would simultaneously make money together. Shortly after is when his song We Are Bad From dropped and Vibes Cartel wasted no time hitting back with his own record We No Care Where You Are Bad From and Sasko said that Cartel did this without waiting for him to put his signature on a contract that would lay out how the beef would go. Either way, Sasko decided it wasn't in his best interest to move forward with the clash so he just let it go now sasko was cool with bounty killer and they were close so this damaged the relationship between cartel and bounty a little bit it would get even worse when another dance hall artist named spraga benz decided that he would respond for sasko by dropping a diss record of his own titled done seen it and cartel wasted no time responding to this either releasing a response record the exact same day titled f got correction now almost 15 years later in 2020 both Spraga, Sasko, and Vibes all said that the beef was over and that there was no more problems, with Vibes even saying that he would be remixing one of Spraga's songs titled Jump on the Beat, and also, Vibes' son was also featured on this remix. Now, it seems like the three have mended their old wounds, but at the time around 2004 or 2005, whenever this beef actually was, it was detrimental to one of Vibes' most crucial relationships, the one he had built with Bounty Killer. It's rumored that Bounty Killer took the side of Sasko and Spraga, they thought that Vibe should have waited on a contract to be signed before sending shots, but what really drove the wedge between these two is up for speculation. The most popular theory is that when Killer took the side of Sasko and Spraga, it hurt Vibes. So he did what some consider retaliation and went to Bounty Killer's arch nemesis Beanie Man's wedding. To top it off, he even decided to do a song with Bounty Killer's ex-girlfriend, 
Angel. However, when Vibes was asked about it back in the day, he basically said that he decided to leave the alliance because he was growing independently and claims that there was no real animosity between the two, basically making it seem like he just left because he wanted to be independent of everyone else. Vibes Carter has always been a full-fledged member of the alliance in all musical endeavors, but once it, 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 it creeps over beyond music into the realm of, you know what I mean, dealing with people and real feelings, Vibes Carter has to take a stand because, as you know, being the one is a good friend and bounty killer is a mentor. So Vibes Cartel chose to remain neutral and for that choice, you know what I mean, Vibes Cartel has been getting a lot of, you know what I mean, flock from, from the Alliance. So Vibes Cartel has opted to just leave. The bounty killer is a mentor of Vibes Cartel, you know what I mean, over the years, the whole Jamaica know that, so we're always forever grateful and thing, you know what I mean? But you have a time in life where you have to become your own person, you know what I mean, even in real life situations, because if I was to... Um, I followed my father back in the day. I wouldn't even have become an artist. Crossing killer is the price cartels paid for not coming across as quote unquote press button. You know, Vibes Cartel is his own big man. I don't know if maybe because I pay my own bills and I got kids of my own and I, I got house and I got responsibility. Maybe I think is that's why. Once Vibe left the Alliance in 2006, he joined what was referred to as the Portmore Empire, which was a group of dance hall DJs and singers from his Portmore neighborhood. Not only that, but he also formed his own record label, Adija Haim Records, and partnered with the well-known producer, Ansley Not Nice Morris, and together, the two started to sign a ton of artists from the Portmore area. Their roster included Vibes himself, Popcon, Tommy Lee, and Javinci, all of which were super talented artists that were dropping crazy hit records in dance hall. Things were looking up for Cartel, despite falling out with his old teammates, but things were about to get even more intense, as he would find himself in a feud with another artist named Movado, and this beef was so heavily publicized and widespread that many people, including the press, said it was basically the Biggie and Tupac beef of dance hall. After Vibes left the Alliance, there was friction between everybody involved, especially the artists that were still in the Alliance. One of these people was a former collaborator named Movado. Now Movado had been writing and releasing music since at least 2002, but he wasn't aiming for being an artist per se like Vibes was. Instead, he was in the background writing the lyrics. This even included a few songs for Vibes himself. In 2005, Movado dropped his first real single titled The Real McCoy, then it was an instant hit. Movado seen his star presence rise immediately, and people were demanding more from the newcomer. He had his own style and unique melodies that resonated with dancehall fans across the globe. The same way that Vibes came out of nowhere and became the biggest thing to ever hit the stage in this genre just a few years before is the same thing that Movado was doing in 2005. Yo, lyric, yo, me there up on the goalie side. If you want to know. Where if you find me, shooting for man at the bedside. Cause them see too much, them fear avoid me. That's why me there up on the goalie side. Movado was a protege of Bounty Killer, just like Vibes was previously, and he became a sensation in the genre, bringing in a ton of new eyes to Killer's Alliance. These events, Vibes choosing to attend Beanie Man's wedding, where Beanie Man married Bounty's ex, Vibes deciding to leave the Alliance, Movado becoming as popular, if not more popular for a moment than Vibes, it all led to an all-out war happening between the two groups, and Jamaica found itself being split into basically two factions, Gully and Gaza. The names simply represent where the two artists from. Gaza is a section of the water for housing scheme in Portmore, the area where Vibes grew up, and Goli was an area in Cassava Peace, St. Andrew, where Movado was from. When Vibes left the Alliance, he continued to drop his regular hit records, but occasionally he would insert lyrics taking shots at the Alliance and its members, but as Movado's star presence grew, these shots seemed to become more directed towards Movado himself. It's unclear why, but perhaps Vibes felt that Movado was becoming a real threat on the music front. For years, Vibes had ruled the genre with an iron fist, and Movado was quickly breaking the walls down and becoming just as big as Vibes. Either way, this resulted in Movado creating a song titled Mr. Palmer, which is Vibe's real last name, and there was no questioning who it was aimed at because of the name of the song. And in the song, he calls Vibe's an informant, accuses him of bleaching his skin, and drops basically some early 2000 dance hall drill lyrics. I don't know how else to explain it. 
Now, up to this point, Vibes hadn't really name dropped Movado on any records, just sent subliminal. So a lot of people were wondering what made Movado address Vibes publicly like this. And while Movado has never really said himself, an insider in a situation named Foot of Hype basically said that Movado intervened and addressed Vibes publicly on behalf of the Alliance after all the dissing that Vibes was doing. I, I got me, I got to your story now. Why you say Movado pick it up in? And that's why I'm over to pick it up because indeed internally I style the thing with the public don't know. So I'm over to I pick the thing with him over to the step forward and say, killer, make me deal with him. Time done a pre we already. That is why he asked him over to shoot first and Ray Ray Cartel was fucking around and provoking behind the scene long time. So the singer just couldn't take it no more. And say, yo, make me deal with him. So that cause Movado to publicly attack first. Mokatel it been a do some local foolishness. All right. More than that to where we just not gonna talk on this right now. After Movado sent his public diss track at Vibes, Vibes hit back with his own song Mafrado, where he sent direct shots back. Now, while this was supposed to be a war, Gully and Geyser Graffiti started popping up everywhere you look, and real violence started to take place, resulting in several shootings and injuries. The violence even spread to schools, and police say that they seized R-rated Gaza Gully buttons or shirt pins sold by vendors outside of several schools, and the pins featured explicit Photoshop graphics of one artist holding the other severed head with one hand and holding an AK in the other, and even a tourist was attacked by people for playing Movado's music in Gaza territory. This war would continue to plague the streets all of 2006 with violence occurring on both sides. In fact, it got so bad that the police had to step in and in March of 2007, in a police overseeing press conference, the two seemed to reconcile their differences with Vibe saying that their beef was nothing more than a musical endeavor and that there was no real bad blood between them. Movado seconded that thought at the press conference. However, you could tell that there was still some animosity because when Vibe was asked if he would collaborate from people from the alliance moving forward he said the alliance will always be a part of vibes cartel that's where i emerged but they have their own entity while i have mine the portmore empire and people who were there at the press conference to witness it even said that they had their doubts about the unification of the two artists and apparently they were right to doubt it because it didn't take long for these two to be right back at each other's necks and the rumor was that it was all due to a show promoter who had a financial interest in these two continuing the feud. Now remember a while back in this story when Vibes got into it with Ninja Man on stage? Well that happened at a concert called Sting. Well this show was hosted by a company called Supreme Promotions who is headed by a man named Isaiah Lang. Isaiah Lang is the man who would conceptualize each concert each year and was known for creating on stage clashes between artists. This included the one between Ninja Man and Vibes. Well, Sting was slated as usual to have a show in 2008, and leading up to the show, Movado and Vibes started dropping more diss records towards each other. And at the time, it didn't make a lot of sense to people while they were backpedaling from their public statements about not having problems, but with hindsight, some say it's because Isaiah Lang wanted to use this beef as a tool to draw in a crowd for his event. By the way, Isaiah Lang is also considered to be one of the most feared police officers in all of Jamaica. It's just a fun fact that I found interesting. Anyways, the ploy seemed to work because leading up to the 2008 Sting Award, people began to expect an onstage clash between Movado and Vibes and the clash is what they got. The scenario was simple. The two would come on stage, take turns performing their records, and then the crowd would decide who they thought won. Vibes came out fully clad in camo military gear, and Movado came out basically in a police officer's uniform. The two traded song lyrics back and forth, and thankfully the show went down without any violent incidents taking place. Boy, 
The event ended with Movado walking off the stage and Cartel performing a few more songs before leaving the stage himself. When it came to who won, opinions were split. Last, the camera sees of Movado is the CJ being carried aloft by fans declaring he won. Lang for one wasn't having any of that. No, we can't call this one. We're gonna have to we have to do it again in February. We're looking forward for that. Yeah. Feelings were running high in the daybreak hours at Jam World. Alliance for life for the world. Yeah. Yeah. Like a a drop asleep. My father, let me tell you, he's an artist, you know. My father, run out of lyrics. <laughs> Repeat lyrics and then re forward that lyrics. That no make a wind clash. And if you have a panty, you can know. So, cartel. You are the man. The only guy who wrote that tune. I'm feeling more like a casket. Movada all the way, Movada Street. And Gaza is there. Cartel Street, Gaza Street. Golly God, Golly God, you say. The Golly come down for the Gaza, Gaza, they are deep sea. Deep sea Gaza there. I think the bus is not finished. 25 years, I come and sting. I know when Shabba, a ball, a super cat, a fling back back in a crowd. That's not a clash. That's not a clash, and the argument is not a circle. And Cartel are the ball, and Gaza are the ball. And Gaza are the ball. And Gaza are the ball. It wasn't hard finding those who did not. For the free alliance, the alliance on the world street, you see? I'll do a Jamaica done call. You see me, I said the world street. See? To all those free people who are trying to raise evil over good, there's no way you can ball forward for a man when I believe in a God over somebody who fear God. I saw you got to the world. Cartel, you talk on TV, Shakespeare, all is clear. If you big up you see in the world, because my you know that scene, but officially right now, him is the second fastest man in the world. It's the real thing. Wow. <laughs> Baba, the fastest man in the world, but whatever thing you say, don't run. Don't run. Koof. Koof. Me yai, me yai. See ya, see ya. So if you know a TV, J and a ER, and them know where we are, you know, my place and my place, you know. Big up Ryan, you know, don't know. Big up the runner, I knew him. No more trimming around here. Look like he's running, but I'm You know, I'm out. A week later, the arguments were still not settled. Fox is that Vibes Cartel win the clash mm -hmm. because Movado run off stage after I get boo about four consecutive times, after running out of lyrics, after bringing his own bands and eventually leaving with his bands. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Not giving the Vibes Cartel a chance to respond. Mm -hmm. So he was, I was the last man standing, so everybody can see that teacher is the original winner of the clash. So are you disappointed then that a few um, papers and a few articles have said that it's a draw? No, I'm not disappointed. No, in the initial stages, in a few media people, especially in the print media, were of them own ulterior motive was trying to say that Movado win the clash. Mm -hmm. That was before the majority of people got the CD and DVD. Mm -hmm. Cause I know we're living in modern times. You know, mm -hmm. it's not like one time in the night in the seventies. You know, so everybody have access to DVD and CD you now. So, but before that, in the initial stages, a few print media was trying to bias the thing. You know what I mean? But we're pleased with the overall outcome from the streets, not necessarily from the media. Mm -hmm. There are, there are rumors that there might be a rematch. Would you be interested in a rematch? <laughs> so you would do a rematch? Right now. Right, right now. Right now as we're speaking with this microphone. <laughs> you see what I said? So I always say don't run. So this time I guess we need like a cage with a big padlock on it. <laughs> That means him can't run, straight now I tell you. So, uh, a lot of people have said they are surprised that, you know, he was able to st stand up to you toe to toe. Yeah. Uh, were you surprised? No, I wasn't surprised and it wasn't really toe to toe, you know, because as I said before, it was his band. So if you notice and watch back the, the DVD and scrutinize it, you find that at times when I was getting the loud mix to cover up my, my microphone sound, you know what I mean, I, I might get the nice soft mix then. But Five Scottel still prevail because at the end of the day is talent, you know. You know what I mean? So we have no problem with that, man. So Cartel, you're saying that you'd be willing to continue the feud, continue the rivalry between you and Movado? No, it's not really a rivalry as such, you know. It's just a beat down, you know, because as everybody can see, you know. You know what I mean? And I said before, maybe in another 
sport or another field of entertainment. Maybe in running, somebody could have said, yeah, my father win the clash. If it was a running clash, <laughs> you know what I mean? But it's a musical clash, so you have to just say cartel at the last man standing, which is the victorious one. But if Len come with the right money, you know what I mean? Big yard, some of us deal with it. Straight up. No go wrong thing. Everybody does thing and see who oh, dead, don't it? They know that thing too. No, but who, who you get thing? Well, I don't know. I wasn't there. Yeah, you wasn't there. I wasn't there. You watch. I've been looking at the tapes. Yeah. I've been reading um, the articles. Yeah. The articles have been saying that it's a draw. How, how, it, how it becomes a draw? That's what the articles are saying. Right? But why? Well, on the EMS said the next morning after Sting. Everybody, I want to know, Sting go on Friday, Saturday morning, right? Saturday evening, every paper come out. It's a golly God, don't it? That's what, that's what, what's being okay. said. Okay, so all on you know, how comes Monday afternoon? Mm -hmm. Mr. Paper, I come out about Ja. I'm not going to war on Ja. Mm -hmm. When I'm at the station, I'm done. And I mean, I step on the bleach, you know. And I deal with him wicked, you know. You saw me as a car first thing. When I go up on stage, them, them turn on my mic. Mm -hmm. Nothing call me up on stage 15 minutes before me even let know near the stage. Because the things are the whole of them plan. Mm -hmm. In plan, so I go call me up on stage and then I go, come with the wheel out so I know this thing around. Mm -hmm. So I go take a time for get for walk out. Mm -hmm. So the crowd stays now and keep back on the one that go on. Oh, the man no walk out all along. So my father, the question everybody asking you, why did you leave the stage? Because people not, are saying, yeah, that, yeah, 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 I want to step on him, you know. And him turn either to stay, so, you know, him don't know what to do, you know. Mm -hmm. I go so by my walk, you know. I don't come off a stage, you know. I walk and go stand up behind everybody, because I know him I go see me run. Because mm -hmm. I'm a hack. Mm -hmm. But here what now, Jamaica know him, and my fans know him. And the boy I live for my name all along, so I just go over sting, go rub him out. And here what now, you come come do interview and say you win some and you lose some. You have to admit, say so you're dead in your town. Mm -hmm. And stop going, and what are you know? Oh, your friend never come now and I put so much things in the paper. Well, I don't know. You don't feel like so all of them things they want to put in the paper all along. Nothing people tired of them things. People tired of it. Because if you pick up the paper today and something in there about the two artists, them, everybody are going to know who write it. Your yeah, friend, them. That artist is ready for anything because he do have a career. You understand? So he's ready for anything. I don't have time for it. More you tell my fans them this. See? I want the reason to make my guys think of war. Mm -hmm. Because, because the left one, one me you know. I fly, me I fly in the sky, you know. And when I go start looking, you know, I see them down a gun at this God, you know. I bought them now and no God and be a thing, you know. Mm -hmm. And I try to corrupt the youth, them you know. And I just say, hold on there. International level, give me a minute. And I just step where I go to the and come deal with it. So here I am. I do even, I do even me. I do even go do this thing for myself. I go do this thing for the fans, them. Mm -hmm. Because my fans, them are out there. And some man has said, oh, when an artist is afraid, when an artist is this, I know them not bother than me. Because if you notice some man sang, you know, every song of them do sound the same way. You know. Every one of them sound the same way. And just a few words strange. Everything, I do no song that sound the same way. One of my fans them know, I don't know nothing about any rematch. I'm not Jack the Ripper, I don't kill dead people. You understand, my fans? Them, I, 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 I am very sure. I heard that the next artist came on the TV program and said that you lose some and you win some. So you must admit it, so you lose. You understand? And Sting, Sting is not about what the promoter them say. It's about the audience who spend their money. This beef continued brewing pretty much the rest of 2007 and 2008, with more violence pouring over into the streets as fans chose a side and stuck to it. At this point, we started seeing articles popping up blaming Cartel for what all was happening, saying that he was destroying the youth by making people believe his gangsterisms, and pretty much all of the violence that was taking place was blamed on Cartel and his music, despite him repeatedly telling people it's just music and to please not let it spill over into real life. 
However, the government felt differently, and after a mob attack that took place in some inner city neighborhoods inside the capital of Kingston, the government decided it was time to step in again, and on December the 8th, 2009, Cartel and Movado met with Jamaican Prime Minister Bruce Golding in an attempt to end the feud. The government is defending its decision to intervene in the dance hall rivalry between DJs Movado and Vibes Cartel, whose open contempt for each other has divided their fans in what is known as a Gaza Gully conflict. Jamaica House says it was a matter of responsibility to intervene in the conflict, which has such wide reaching tentacles. Nadine McLeod has more. For those who might have doubted the necessity of four government ministers meeting with the two DJs, Daryl Vaz wanted to make this clear. The government thought it very important to have this meeting this morning based on the fact and the impact on the four ministries that were represented there this morning being national security, culture, education and information, the impact that this impasse has been having as it relates to these ministries. And one half of the rivalry, Mavada, sees the opportunity to let it be known that he and Vibes Cartel are by no means foes. I mean, me and Vibes, we're not really enemies, you know what I mean? So as I speak, me and Vibes right here, you know what I mean? I never threw a stone off, off, off of Vibes before. He never done the same, you know what I mean? So it's just about music, but... As we say, we have the fans out there, you know what I mean? And, and people take it to a different level. Vibes Cartel concurred. Yeah, well, yeah, man, we agree with what my father said a while ago. And as a matter of fact, we have plans to do another collaboration because you have to remember the first time my father and I did a song, it was a collaboration, you know. Those are the happiest days of my life. So Definitely. it's like, now that is what we're bringing back now. So in the beginning of our meeting, so is it in the end of the war. So. We are coming back with <laughs> But Vibes Cartel and Mavada have been here before, a different place, a different year, but the same story. Back in 2007, the DJs had called the truth, making many skeptical of their sincerity today. But the government apparently isn't in doubt. As the two DJs emerged from their meeting with the ministers and the Peace Management Initiative, Daryl Vaz outlined some of the projects the two have agreed to work on. And as such, we have proposed a joint treat between both artists at locations to be identified before Christmas, a paint-out day, both in the schools and in all the communities across Jamaica, which will be dealing with the Gaza Gully graffiti and other graffiti. A joint song to appeal to the supporters of both artists. A peace concert to be arranged in conjunction with the both artists and, of course, the Ministry of Youth and Culture. Mr. Vaz said the private sector is also on board. Nadine McLeod, TVJ News. And a local story we promised you earlier. A five-point initiative is to be undertaken to stem the warring gully Gaza feud. Measures agreed on at a meeting at Jamaica House involving the artists at the heart of the conflict, Vibes Cartel and Mavado, as well as four government ministers. The measures include a peace concert involving both artists, a painting exercise to remove graffiti, the wearing of t-shirts with portraits of both artists, the joint songs by the artists making appeals to their supporters, and a treat with both artists present. Now, the ministers present at the meeting were Education Minister Andrew Holness, Information Minister Darrell Vaz, National Security Minister Dwight Nelson, as well as other government officials. The dance hall artists, Mavado and Vibes Cartel, have made it clear they are not enemies and it's just about the music. They ended that press conference with a list of stuff the government was going to make them do, which included a joint peace concert that was scheduled to take place in Barbados, but the Barbadian Prime Minister stepped in and canceled the show before it could take place, probably out of fear of it going terribly wrong. Now, officially, the two stopped dissing each other and moved on with life after this, but this wasn't the complete end of the story because a year later, Movado's son was charged and convicted of murder, which resulted in him getting a life sentence in prison. 
and Bob's would find himself in a very similar situation around the exact same time. After the beef with Movado, Vibes didn't slow down. In fact, he only became bigger. He released singles like Romping Shop, which debuted in the Billboard Top 100 songs in America, giving Vibes yet another international hit. And then he followed that up with his single Clarks, which was in the top three reggae songs, racking up more plays than any other song for over 40 weeks in a row. Clarks was a brand of shoes that was popular in the 1990s, but basically fell off before the turn of the century. Vibes basically single-handedly revived the company by making this song and two more, Clarks 2 and Clarks 3, shouting the brand out. After seeing how much power he had, the next year in 2011, he decided he was going to release his own shoe line, branded Addies, and even launched a soap company called Cake Soap, which was primarily meant to be used as a skin bleaching product. Honestly, Bob's was on fire at this point, and he may have gotten the biggest opportunity yet when he was offered his very own reality TV show called Teacher's Pet, where 20 women would live in a mansion in Kingston and compete for the affection of Vibes, kind of like a Flavor Flav type of situation. Now, things were set for Vibes to have an incredible year, possibly his best year so far, at least as far as his career was concerned, but all that came to a halt when on September 29, 2011, he was arrested by Jamaican police for possession of cannabis. Five days later, Lime, the network that was going to be broadcasting his show, announced that the show had been canceled due to Vibe's arrest, and this was only the beginning of his problems. While he was locked up on these weed charges, the police doubled back and hit him with an even more serious charge, this time murder. On October 3rd, 2011, about a week after his arrest, the Jamaican Major Investigation Task Force, also known as MIT, charged Vibes with murder, conspiracy to murder, and illegal possession of a firearm. Police say that on Monday, July 11, 2011, Cartel, along with other men, conspired to kill a man named Barrington Bossy Burton, a 27-year-old businessman and music promoter who was based in Portmore. Burton was murdered while standing with friends along Walker's Avenue in the Gregory Park area of Portmore. While sitting in jail awaiting trial on these charges, Vibes authored and released a book titled The Voice of the Jamaican Ghetto. And the book was released in July of 2012 with a message attached to it that said, Babylon can incarcerate the messenger, but not the message. An early hint that things with his legal troubles may not be exactly what they seem. For the charges against him in the case of the Barrington Burton murder, Vibes was granted bail on March 23, 2012 for 3 million Jamaican dollars. However, even though he could post the bail, he wasn't released. And that's because the Jamaican government doubled back and charged him with another murder, a second one, and this one was for the murder of a man named Clive Williams, also known as Lizard. Now this case can get a bit confusing for sure and the details are all over the place, but I'm gonna do my best to make sense of what all went down for you guys. So starting back when Vibes was arrested for the murder of Burton, the police did sweeping raids of a bunch of his properties. They started their search in Kingston's upscale Norbrook community where Vibes was living at the time. Then they went to a property on Swallowfield Avenue in Kingston's Havendale area. That residence was the scene of a fire a few weeks before Vibes was arrested. A scorched computer hard drive and several boxes were removed from the property and collected for evidence. They then drove to Portmore to a home that was reportedly owned by Cartel's mom where a number of items were confiscated there too. Now, a lot of people have claimed that Clive Williams' body was never found and officially it wasn't, but in the original court documents it clearly states that Vibe's home in Havendale, the one that had been burned down, there was a partially burned decomposing body found inside. Now, this sounds pretty bad, right? Well, yeah, of course, but here's where it gets interesting. From the start of this thing, Vibes has claimed that this entire case was a ploy by the government to set him up because he had too much influence in Jamaica, right? Hence why he said Babylon can incarcerate the messenger but not the message. Now, whether you believe that Vibes was set up or not is up to you, but there may be more credibility to his statement than a lot of people think because this info about a burned out decomposing body hit the news after the information was released by the police, but this body was never identified or even mentioned again after the initial reports 
it's like it just disappeared which is pretty strange if you ask me anyways so they have him in jail pending two murder charges one for barrington burton and one for clive williams and it wasn't looking good for vibes but after about a year in detention vibes will get some good news on july 24 2012 almost a year after his arrest when the jury returned a not guilty verdict in the barrington burton case it was a solid victory for vibes but his struggle was far from over because he still had a whole nother murder case to go through his trial for this one was originally scheduled for january 21st 2013 but had to be postponed due to a lack of unbiased jurors and the trial actually didn't get started until november 18th of that year the trial lasted a total of 65 days making it the longest trial in jamaican history and at the end of it cartel was found guilty by an 11 member jury who voted 10 to 1 of the murder of 27 year old clive lizard williams on the 3rd of april 2014 cartel was sentenced to life imprisonment with the eligibility for parole after serving 35 years from very early on Thursday, March 13, 2014, the police instituted pedestrian and vehicular restrictions in downtown Kingston as hundreds of Vibes Cartel's fans gathered for a verdict. After 65 days of trial, delayed starts, 24 prosecution witnesses and six for the defense, Justice Lennox Campbell turned over the matter to the 11-member jury at 3.45 p.m. Outside the courtroom, there was tension, and in Cartel's hometown too, in the Waterford community of Portmore, they call Gaza City. Yeah, sir, you so live. Yeah, it is a Cartel, you so live. Right, yes, sir. Yeah. 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 This is a Portmore, please clear the road. Yeah. After one hour and 53 minutes, the jurors returned with a 10 to 1 verdict. With the verdict coming under two hours and divided at the same time, the judge sent them back to reconsider. Minutes later, they would reemerge again with a 10 to 1 verdict. Adija Palmer, guilty. Sean Campbell, guilty. Kyra Jones, guilty, and Andre St. John, guilty. The fifth co-accused, Shane Williams, was found not guilty. Media scuffle out of the way, Williams' lawyer, Everton Duar, said, he was happy for his client. Can you say on what basis you're going to make your appeal? The lawyers who are going to deal with that, including myself, will have to look back through the transcripts and arrive at a process. As it stands here now, let me just indicate, and all who have ears here, the jury has given a verdict and we accept it and move to the next process. The prosecutors have to make sure that in their conduct, it is not that we are striving for a winning situation. We strive to put up the best evidence that is available. There are persons in the system, in the police force, in the prosecuting service, in the judiciary, court staff who have integrity and who are committed to public service. No doubt it's a long prison sentence that they handed down, but why do they think that Vibes killed Clive Williams in the first place? Well, it all goes back to when they arrested him for having weed. When they did, they seized his cell phone. And according to police, it was rife with evidence. To start things off, the police had received testimony from Clive's girlfriend saying that the day he went missing, she received texts from him. And he said that he believed he was on his way to Vibe's house at Havendale with his friend Leonard Chow to admit that they were responsible for some lost guns. She claimed that he told her he was so scared that he was shaking. He begged her to call the police because Vibes was about to kill him. And according to Chow, the man that went with Lizard, they pleaded the Vibes in his living room that they would pay him back. While they begged, another man named Kahira Jones grabbed a hold of Lizard. At this point, Chow ran into the other room. When he came back, he said he saw Lizard's body lying motionless on the floor with Vibes' barber, Andre Massa St. John, standing beside him holding a block in his hand. 
Now, that's what Chow told the police. They also had messages sent from Vibe's phone to an associate of his who was also charged in this case named Sean Campbell. And in these messages, Vibe's allegedly told him that he was going to chop up the lizard boy and that as long as Sean was alive, they could never find Lizard's body. The messages and testimony from Chow were entered into evidence. However, the validity of the text messages quickly came under scrutiny, with Vibe's defense arguing that the data had been manipulated and that these messages were sent after after Vibe's phone was seized, but the judge in this case basically told the defense attorney to shut up and sit down with no probe into if it was true, and the judge allowed these messages to be read to the jury. Day one of the Vibe's cartel appeal hearing got underway in Kingston this morning with a claim by one of the lawyers for the dancehall artist and his co-accused Sean Storm. According to Bianca Samuels, the metadata of the text message prosecutors used to convict her clients shows that the text was actually created on July 6, 2011, that's six weeks before the August murder of Clive Lizard Williams. This is what the text message found on Cartel's phone had said. Between me and you, we chop up the boy Lizard fine, fine and dash him away now. As long as we're alive, them can never find him. This one has left me puzzled, Samuels told the appeal court. To that, the president of the Court of Appeal, Dennis Morrison, responded, Our silence was sharing in your puzzlement. Justice Morrison, along with Justices Patrick Brooks and Frank Williams, are hearing the appeal against the murder and conviction of Cartel, Sean Storm, Kyra Jones, and Andre St. John. Samuel said the development raises more than a reasonable doubt about the integrity of the evidence, which should not have been put to the jury. She also said the electronic file lifted from Cartel's phone was modified three hours after the device was seized by a top police investigator. The text message was used during the entertainer's 17-week murder trial. But what is metadata and why is it so critical? Essentially, metadata is the back-end information. It gathers and summarizes behind-the-scenes details on information that is posted online. Information like the time and date of the creation of the data, the creator or author of the data, and the file size. But that's not all, because they also found voice notes from Vibe where he seemed to be talking about Clive losing some shoes and some laces. And for those of you who don't know, shoes is a slang for guns and laces is a slang for bullets. Why Vibes will be recording this stuff into a voice note is unknown, but apparently he did. And this is what he said. Um, brother, I know it's a blood clot lizard and we. I will call my phone today and tell me, say, them can't find the two blood clot new shoes that mommy give them dog. So them lock them in our house. Side of all feet to a build up dog in a blood clot house. They lock two shoes and can't find my bum buckler shoes, Virgin. And I come tell me, fuck your me is dog. Me, yo, I just tell them, say, make sure I get my shoes by 8 o'clock in a bad man. Laugh in a car. I ah, hear you know, get I think I uh, say uh, that me I tell my dog say I uh, with you me I uh, hear reason about the said fucking thing. But as I me tell you, hombre, the man where them get the blood clot shoes still like, dog. If eight o'clock come on me I get my shoes at uh, the same fucking thing, dog. So if them want them friends to live, them better get my blood clot shoes. You know, more time I a of follow up certain science thing in the dog. When you know say a girl tell me say she call a woman. And the woman can tell her instantly, say, ah, the boy will go crunch with the yeah. move the shoes, for sell it, for sell it, move the shoes and for sell them, you know, dog. And you know, say, me, I say, I made back, and I say, where the yeah, when I go crunch, it's a portion of man. A portion, it's a portion of man forward, you know, dog. So, I didn't even know which man, bitch, in. And I tell the dog, yo, the batty boy, them, I tell me, say, they can't find two of my shoes, you know, dog. I kill one of them, you know, I give them till 8 o'clock, forget what I'm bum buckler shoes. As a dead blood clot, man, that, you know. My dad, hear me, I say. You know, more ask you, about the program with Siva, because Eva, them things they're not supposed to be on a Siva government, you know. Siva supposed to keep check on them things there at all times and make sure, say, them in them eyesight, you know. You understand me, I deal. And before me, I left, you know, I don't even like or a ton of more because some man up there, so when I see blood, I don't know some of them, you know. So, me, I deal with them come like say, anybody new, dog. Them just bring in, they're not busy. They don't even check on some man to find out them background or nothing. You see, me, I deal with I want to, me, I tell you, you know, man, them do it already, you know. They make them get no more chance to do that again, you know. I tell you straight, you know. I bust up any time after eight, and a man again a good talk on it, then. Bust off a man head, and here we go do. 
you have a bus off a man that will live down there, and one of the strange man that down there, two man that you have a bus off one time. You can't afford for so much things I get missed, number damn. A joke thing. Dog, my first man will page, you know, because I ask him, say, oh, Bridget, you know, you have blood clot around our place. And you don't even know nothing about dog. The man tell me, say, I put them here, you know. And bandit tell me, say, thing, they miss it from sat the man in a you know, bad man. It's a little bird call me and tell me, I'm a piece of these are them, and them I tell me, say, I eat them a gob out, you know. I said, dog, I'm going to better find man thing for us, you know, dog. Because I'm even, oh, what, yo, you know, say, I'm one of the hombre, the them, them give the thing for luck. I didn't even know that the youth, they know, problem. Come like a yesterday, man, come live, boy, you know. I didn't even know blood clot, you know. So I make sure I tell the man, them say, I want my blood clot shoes by 8 o'clock, and I go fuck up to them, dog. Come with you know, say, come like you're a prophet, dog. Cause you, you say something to me, say. You know, like up there, so because every little man just run in and them just accept them and them. They don't know some of their meds, dog, where you say. And one man say, find out where the third man come from. What them sell at the shoes, because me don't know him, and me don't have a youth to grow about it. You know, so I run the file, problem child. The man, them tell me, say, the hombre not even live there for one year, dog. And guess where they say the hombre come from? Walter, I mean, hombre. Walter. Walter, I mean, dog. That's me, I, me have to call this and we and diss them up and say, Pussy wall in the city, I turn off the man you spawn up. Because man left from bad place and come over here to come see so now. Some little giggy giggy laughy laughy batty boy. And take the shoes, I go give him friend them a turn and come back, come see them go down and go on like him, they know the shoes miss now. And me tell them to tell the boy they say, I get back my shoes, him and him blood clam, mum I go dead in a bad man. Come on. Remember, you tell me what the so you make all of the shoes them stay around a black five. Yeah man, I dessert them for stay, man. No more shoes in a rat tone, everything stay upon your side. You see what I deal with? No more shoes in a rat on a blood clot up there them for stay. Free and dead, nothing for them. No, if you say nothing bad, man, I don't have free that already. I just want them to go back from my shoes. That's me can send them down from the Gaza, dog. Suck them mothers. Them want, them going to make some one pop and make a year so them have one pop up. Them going to kill two of them. No, you see, no. And now, you see where the real thing there. You see, me, I said, it's a matter of time, you know. You see, everybody show up, them blood clot colors. Because the thing did spread, and it'll take right, it'll take it time, draw right back. You know, the little square where they did before. You see, me, I deal with. So, everybody show up, them colors now, so you know what time it is. You see, me, I deal with my boss. A real fucking thing, you have to I mean, it's not that free, so. And I said, really, I right back for you, because everything must go right back down from the Gaza, dog. Big woman thing, dog, them for go bridging. Why well, then, it's better fade away, there because less people you have to deal with, and uh, more you know how your things stay, you know, but it's when it's wider away up there, so, because some boy I do something and I come around and you don't even know, you know, come skin off them teeth, you know. So you said, less people you have to deal with, better blood. So you have everything in your palm, you know, where you can know. Anything jump off you know where for pre and where for look. But when it's too far up in any place, so them water to mix up up there, so dog. I think man catch it, I never even reach as far as third world neither. Because from day one minute, you know, them pussy there, you know, dog. I just too shatty the power on me, you know. And shatty bring ratty, you know, dog. And I see it, you may not back come to a big in farmer, you know, dog. So it should even reach us so from day one, dog. My dad, no matter them get too comfortable neither, you know. I sit down over this and feel like such so them get a phone call from me and you tell them that, you know, them for a program that, that can reach him back in the night or a morning and for the back on the end, so a man forget to wet up and not forget too comfortable because them going like them one style blood clot man thing. So I mean, I tell them that them thing I'm going to see them are coming over, I could have tell them from a long time, you know, but you know, more time I try to link you, so man I go and they want to shut up, man out of the thing, you know. Because I'm going to sit down from a block and observe how they move, you know. How they're friendly with newcomers, you know. You see me, I deal with. So, I'm going to sit down and think they're not going to get comfortable. They're going to keep moving and I keep my mind open at all time. I don't know where the blood clot will reach them. A real talk, you're talking a problem. I page back my dog and make him page him because I'm going to the program, you know, dog. So, I call him right now and make him know what I'm going on, bro. I don't them boys enough to sleep all in them beds and hours a night and them supposed to have pray a bag of thing them for up. Not sleep for no man until they think them forward, my dad. Real thing, bad man. 
Ah, man, a real bum bucker thing, dog. Big old man thing. Yeah, I hear about it, man. My dad, what a program. Don't hear from me from yesterday, you know. So, I pray and I wonder what I go on. I mean, know what I go on, my dad. Bless it. Same thing as the rest of man. The boy, I him take the thing, them dog. But the boy, mama up the dog. Dash, me, I make the man, them dash away, you know, man. My dad. Third world. No, them dash are we don't our side. If I know what I wrote our third world, no we don't have our side. You hear that? Bro, in a Chevy yard, you know. Chevy yard, the pussy world girl live in you know. Yeah, mama, just call along there a while ago, people so them go about them and them not see the man them. Come like the man them take for themselves. And watch this now, no? A right, Ross, glad place. Can I say, oh, there's so many times. And boy, the angel have to give account for that. Put him back in the spot. He swear me, David. Yeah, man. They are. They are waiting for the priest them to link me back and let me know what they do. Because if they don't say nothing about the thing come here, because they will get fucking at that. Do it, yeah, do it, man. A mother ass thing, man. So when, so when lizard and we, them, them cut. Because I said, I'm going to look for them yesterday, and no man, I said, I'm not see them, you know, the man, I said, come like and cut them, cut, you know. Yeah, but problem, Charlie, if them cut, where the mark up go? That's a rascal, that question, I'm there. Them, they're them, and them can't cut, you know, with that, you're mad. Well, they need to cut, you know, and I said, I'll buy it back. You see, the whole of them, where they're on silver, them know how our blood clot go on, you know. You see me? I guess so. If the man not see we and the man not see lizard and the boy, them still a call back in the scheme and a link with who sir man who are give them information and what go on and who them see a walk past in a rat town cause so them things go in you see me I deal with. So the whole of them up at that blood clad know what go on. Them take man for four. See what do you say it's still number then? I saw your thing setting up so it's setting up for civil civil response each in the Right now, you shouldn't have kill of yourself, you know. I see if you go about them, you know, because I see them use, I see what you them, you know, you see me? So I see if you make some phone call and I make them know, say, yo, watch this. Ray, you know, you see me, sir. So. You shouldn't have kill of yourself, and then, and that me, I tell you, because most of them, I want to, oh, you're just a far out, so man, they over just don't care, but man, it's the thing like how for money, sir. No, but I see him, so me, I deal with it. I feel laugh, dog. Because I can't mind with a virgin. Because I don't kill out myself, dog. I just call Sean up to this man and tell him, say, hombre, what about my things, them? I make me get my money to buy back my things, them. And I do what I do with, with whoever. I just want to get back my thing and I you respond to it. So I make sure I tell him that this morning. AJ, you know, so I just hear a while ago, say, badness and danger must to kick off on the line this morning. And it seems like he come like bad danger, bad at the man them. The man them come like them afraid of danger, dog. Me, I go on things, man. You know if you say nothing, man. Just, 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 just listen. So you know, you use that blood class, you know. <laughs> <laughs> ah, I have a problem, child. Me there, I put on a tattoo, sir. Oh, Why, you just see tattoo? Yeah, I'm a bride of Chucky, man. Oh. Yeah, you say lizard. And the new boy, my name Browns, two of them me used to get dashed away, you see me? Because be a man called me and asked me if me here, you know? You see me? And a nigga from Night Town just called me a while ago and said, two men get dashed away for the end. So me asked the team, say, me ask, me be like me, I know who we want to talk, you see me? Yo, tell me exactly where you hear, bad man. Come on, know where I'm going. Yo, you know, you use a blood class, you know? <laughs> So who them said dash them with? Linky. Linky, give me a link this morning. You see me, I say, me, so I do up here, and me and him there are reason. Out of the blue, I just hear the man, I say, yo, dash a lizard in there, I say, blood club. But I say, me, I say, I'm say, say, lizard get dash, I'm not here from you. So I wonder, what I go on? So I suck up now, I start a link back a yard. So I just want to tell you, who the first man to tell you, and where him hear it from. Mm, just a while ago that happened. Uh -huh.
So, yeah, there's these voice notes where they're saying that Clive misplaced two new pair of shoes. And then there's the messages where Clive is saying that he was going to Vibe's house in Havendale. And to top it all off, there was also footage leaked to the press that was allegedly Vibe's cartel and his accomplices on the day Clive was killed inside Vibe's house in Havendale plotting a murder. One man could be seen with the pickaxe, another man could be seen with what appears to be blood stains on his t-shirts, and then you could hear them discussing things like creeping up behind somebody and cutting their throat. You could hear Vibes tell another man when he swings the pickaxe, make sure not to swing it back too far because he might hit him, and a whole bunch of other stuff. It really don't look good here. Y'all watch the footage. This is pretty much all of the evidence that they had when it came to prosecuting Vibes. And after receiving his life sentence, you would think that it would slow him down a bit, but not really. Even behind walls, Vibes has managed to release new music yearly, with some even topping the charts. And this is true all the way up until present day. He still has music being released till this day. A convicted murderer. The dance hall artist of Vibes Cartel was arrested before daybreak this morning. Yet still one of Jamaica's biggest dance hall acts. Gold will always be gold. Gold will never be silver. And Vibes Cartel is gold. Can prison officials stop Vibes Cartel? It is the work of the correctional officers that have stopped the illegal recording of songs. Or should they try to profit from him? The deal is you produce X. I give you a commission on what you produce. Offer the relatives of the victims some form of financial compensation. Cartel, whose real name is Adija Palmer, was convicted of a heinous murder that prosecutors say took place in 2011. Found guilty of killing Clive Lizard Williams Empire to the world, right? with three co-conspirators. Williams' body was never found. But even as he serves out his life sentence and appeals his conviction, he still runs his businesses. A clothing line based on his Gaza community in Port Moore and managed by his business partner, Mike Dawson. We sell online um, and most of the business comes from Europe. A book, a play in the works, a record label, and most significantly, his music. But not everyone thinks he should be allowed to wield that kind of influence. Just listen to Jamaica's then opposition spokesperson on youth and culture, Lisa Hanna, in a local radio interview about cartel. If you are convicted, 
until you are not convicted. Perhaps it is that your music needs not being played on the radio. Even more unfair to some is how is he allowed to record in the first place if he is. We need to find out how the songs are being made, how they're getting out, is there corruption in the prison system. In 2016, Rolling Stone magazine reported Cartel had released more than 50 songs that year alone. The magazine quoting Cartel through his lawyer denied recording in prison, saying these songs were the fruits of a massive deposit of unreleased vocal material left behind before his arrest, updated for the moment by a cadre of trusted producers. We visited one of Cartel's producers who showed us how he's been updating old unreleased songs. So this though says April 22, 2016. Yeah, so that's okay. actually when he was in prison. Okay, this was up in. This is when I transferred a 24 truck at Mixing Lab, his vocal, to the R drive and take it off of the R drive to my thumb drive. Yeah, and, and it was voiced track. when? It was voiced 2001. Raw. Mixing mm. up recording studio. We got the tapes in and stuff, so... How do you get the newness put into the songs? <laughs> when we fly back these old songs and these new beats, we cut them up and take out certain words out of it and put it on the intro and it sound like it's words of today. And the ones that cannot work, what we do, we get um, other artists to go and collaborate. Do you ever find that you need like an updated version of Cartel's voice? Let me tell you something, I'm going to break this down to you, okay? Gold will always be gold. Gold could never be silver. What I'm saying? And Vibes Cartel is gold. No care what, old, new or whatever. Do so you have to do. let him know that you're doing this? No, because he invites the songs in front of me and stuff, but if I feel like there's an issue or problem and stuff, I contact his legal representative. And do you really check with the attorney or do you just call him up behind bars? Shit. So you got phone in prison? Who you call? Do you believe that he's recording behind bars? Do you believe me? that personally? Yes. I don't think so. I think these songs are old songs. But based on how current his music sounds, it's widely believed in Jamaica Cartel must be recording from behind bars, at least to some extent. We visited Horizon Remand Center where he was housed for most of 2016. At the time, there was an expo showcasing furniture, paintings, bedding and crafts, all made by prisoners. The superintendent at the time, Marcia Cummings Page, would not comment on cartel, but told us contraband is something all prisons face the world over. Cell phone is not a problem in Jamaica alone, it's a problem international. And no matter what you do, and we, we will try to stem it, but it's an international something really give us brain rocking, nerve rocking. I thought you had some kind of system where they block the transmission of cell phone or radio waves. That's not effective. She admits some correctional officers facilitate the trade. We have correctional officers who have been bringing in phone and drugs and they were caught and went to the court and were sentenced. So have you ever seen any of the people who were on your staff ever in your lifetime enter the prison system as a prisoner? Yes. In an access to information request, we asked Jamaica's Ministry of National Security whether any correctional officers had ever been disciplined in relation to encounters with cartel. We were told that answer was exempt under the act. But one inmate who filmed this video of Inside Horizon on his unauthorized cell phone told us, outside of the official prison programs, money is what talks behind bars, at least to some extent. We have not been able to authenticate the video recording. How did you get your phone? Because you say you got two. Be a police. It's a correctional officer or a police? No, a police. A police and a police. So how does it work? All right. If you want a phone, if you want a phone, you will have to do it. My phone is put in the room. You can do it. And just leave it to me. I understand. I'm going to leave my people. I'm going to leave it in the morning. How much is the money? For the phone. So do most prisoners behind bars have phones? Yeah. yeah. And what do most prisoners use the phone to do? My company, you know, I start to play the game and 
Incarcerated dancehall star Vibes Cartel is reportedly in more trouble. A reported raid on Cartel Cell in 2013 found two cell phones, a DVD player and an iPod. Though his attorneys reportedly said another inmate had claimed ownership of the phones and the other items were approved by the remand center authorities, many people felt he was being granted special privileges as caricatured in this cartoon. But Cummings Page and our inmate at Horizon told us Cartel was treated just like other inmates. The Cartel producer True Blue that we spoke to was killed a few weeks after our taping. Police told us in early 2018 they do not have a motive for the killing. We did not get to independently verify the existence of the old cartel recordings before his death. But the owner of the studio confirmed Blue recorded cartel at his studio before the artist went to prison in 2011 and that Blue came there to convert some dated cartel recordings to digital in 2016. Despite being convicted of murder, Vibes has claimed his innocence since the beginning, saying that he was set up by the government who was mad that he had too much influence. He filed appeal after appeal since his conviction to no avail until just a few weeks ago. He filed an appeal and the highest court in the land decided to quash his conviction and allow him to have a new trial. This is because they found out that the jury had been tainted during the first trial. According to court records, the judge was made aware that one juror had attempted to bribe other members members of the jury to return a not guilty verdict. Despite the judge knowing that this had happened, he decided to allow that jury to deliberate and come to a decision on this case, something that the higher court said was baffling. They said that the judge should have threw this case out and tried for a new trial with a new jury that wasn't tainted in order to protect the integrity of the court system, but that's not what the judge did. Instead, he allowed the jury to deliberate and convict cartel. Not only that, but he sent them to deliberate at four in the afternoon, and a lot of people thought that he should have had them come back the next day, as having them deliberate this late in the evening could put undue pressure on them to return a verdict quickly, as it was already late in the day. After Cartel was convicted, the juror who tried to bribe the rest of the jury was arrested and charged with perverting the course of justice, but according to the high courts, this jury should have never even had the ability to decide this case to begin with. Judgment in the matter of Sean Campbell, Adija Palmer, Kahira Jones, and Andre Sinjan against the King. On the 13th of March 2014, following a 64-day jury trial in the Home Circuit Court in Kingston, Jamaica, the appellants, Sean Campbell, Adija Palmer, Kahira Jones and Andre Sinjan, were convicted of the murder of Clive Lizard Williams, to whom I shall refer as the deceased. At trial, the prosecution case was that the deceased and another man, Lema Chow, had been given two unlicensed firearms belonging to Palmer for safekeeping. On the 16th of August 2011, Campbell summoned Chow and the deceased to Palmer's house after they had failed to comply with Palmer's deadline for returning the weapons. The prosecution alleged that they were met on arrival by Palmer, Jones and Sinjin, and that Chow and the deceased were both attacked after which Chow saw the deceased lying motionless on the ground with Jones bending over him. Chow escaped, but the deceased was never seen again. Police attended Palmer's house on the 22nd of August 2011. They noticed the house smelled of disinfectant. On the 25th of August, they cordoned off the perimeter wall, treating the premises as a crime scene. When they returned on the 27th of August, they found that the entire interior of the house had been destroyed by fire. On the 29th of August, police forensics reported a foul odour emanating from the living room. On a further visit on the 30th of September, it was discovered that the rear of the house had been demolished. Police dug at the premises but did not find a body. The police seized the mobile phones of Palmer and Sinjin. Text messages, voice notes, and a video from those phones were put in evidence at trial. The prosecution also relied on telecommunications data which the police had obtained from Digicel, a communications provider. The 
prosecution case was that the mobile phone evidence and telecommunications data, taken as a whole with Chow's evidence, proved the fact of the killing, the reason for the killing, the method of disposal of the deceased's body, and the identity of at least one of the killers, namely Palmer. The four appellants each denied murdering the deceased. At trial, the appellants objected to the telecommunications data being admitted as evidence. They argued that the data was inadmissible because it had been obtained in breach of the Interception of Communications Act and the fundamental right to the protection of privacy of communications guaranteed by the Charter of Fundamental Rights and Freedoms contained in the Jamaican Constitution. <coughs> the judge admitted the evidence. He ruled that the data could be relied upon by the prosecution even if it had been obtained in breach of the Charter or the Interception of Communications Act. Over the course of a 64-day trial, there occurred a series of incidents involving the jury. The jury was reduced to 11 members after a jury was discharged almost eight weeks into the trial. On the final day of the trial, it was brought to the judge's attention that a member of the jury, who will be referred to as Juror X, had attempted to bribe other members of the jury. The judge questioned the jury forewoman who stated that Juror X had offered bribes to each of the other jurors to acquit the appellants. The judge asked counsel for the prosecution and the defense if the trial could continue. It would not have been possible only to discharge Juror X because under the Jury Act, a trial for murder cannot continue with fewer than 11 jurors. The judge decided to proceed with his summing up and gave a direction to the jury, reminding them of their function. The jury retired to consider its verdict at 3.42 p.m. The jury returned at 6.08 p.m. and by a majority of 10 to 1, convicted all four appellants of the deceased's murder. A fifth defendant was unanimously acquitted. Juror X was immediately arrested and was later convicted of attempting to pervert the course of justice. There was no evidence to connect his activities with the appellants. The appellants appealed against their conviction to the Court of Appeal of Jamaica, which dismissed their appeals. The Court of Appeal granted permission to appeal to the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council on three grounds, which were, first, that the trial judge failed properly to inquire into allegations of juror misconduct, secondly, that the trial judge departed from standard practice in inviting the jury to retire to consider their verdict so late in the day putting undue pressure on them to reach a verdict, and thirdly, that the trial judge erred in admitting the telecommunications data because it had been obtained in breach of the Interception of Communications Act and the Charter. The Judicial Committee of the Privy Council has unanimously concluded that the appeals should be allowed and the appellant's convictions should be quashed on the ground of juror misconduct and that the case should be remitted to the Court of Appeal of Jamaica to decide whether to order a retrial of the appellants for the murder of Clive Williams. The board has considerable sympathy with the dilemma faced by the trial judge on the final day of a long and complex trial. Following the allegations of bribery, he had either to continue with the 11 remaining jurors or to discharge the jury. Despite this, the board considers that the approach taken by the judge was a material irregularity in the course of the trial, which makes it necessary to quash the convictions. This is for three reasons. First, the direction to the jury on the final day was inadequate to save the situation. The judge simply reminded the jury that they had sworn or affirmed that they would return verdicts in accordance with the evidence they had heard in court. The judge did not refer to the alleged bribery, of which, if the allegations were true, the jurors were already aware. Secondly, the trial continued with the allegedly corrupt juror serving as one of its 11 members. In the board's view, there should have been no question of allowing juror X to continue to serve on the jury. Allowing juror X to remain on the jury is fatal to the safety of the convictions which followed. 
it was an infringement of the appellant's fundamental right to a fair hearing under the Jamaican Constitution. Thirdly, the judge should have considered whether the remaining jurors might have become, consciously or unconsciously, prejudiced for or against one or more of the appellants as a result of juror X's behavior. For example, there was a danger that the attempted bribe could have made the other jurors overcompensate, consciously or unconsciously, if they assumed that the offer must have come from one of the appellants and that therefore they must be guilty. The judge took no account of this risk. The board is very mindful of the serious consequences which may flow from having to discharge a jury shortly before the end of a long and complex criminal trial. It is also very conscious of the danger of deliberate attempts to derail criminal trials by engineering situations in which it is necessary to discharge the jury. In England and Wales, there is legislation which allows a judge in certain situations to discharge a jury because of jury tampering and to continue the trial by judge alone. There is no such legislation in Jamaica. It follows that there will be occasions where, as in this case, a court will have no alternative but to discharge a jury and end the trial in order to protect the integrity of the system of trial by jury. In view of its conclusion on the issue of juror misconduct, the board holds that it is not necessary to express a concluded view on the other two grounds of appeal. For these reasons, the appellant's appeals should be allowed. The court is now adjourned. And with that, Bob's is said to have a new trial in the future if the courts of Jamaica allow it to happen. In the eyes of the highest court, though, Bob's is considered an innocent man at this point, and we'll have to see what all happens in the future. Granted, this new trial isn't being ordered because the evidence was tampered with or because the evidence was lacking, but instead because one juror decided to bribe the others to return a not guilty verdict. But I can see how the high court can reach the conclusion that the rest of the jurors may have thought that this bribe came from Vibes or from somebody on Vibes' team, indirectly making them think that he was guilty, which in fact would have made this trial super unfair. It's been a crazy road, and in June of 2024, we'll find out what the path moving forward is for Vibes, but until then, that's basically the story of Vibes Cartel. Now, I was super sick during the making of this video, so I apologize if I sound a little nasally. That's my fault. I'm just a little bit sick, but if you enjoyed the content, be sure to hit the like button, subscribe, tap the notification bell so you get notified every time I upload a video. As always, it's been fun rocking with y'all, man. I'm out.